Hi guys, I hope you're good. Welcome to Creative Cuts, a channel where I build, paint and create things. Now I've had a lot of requests asking for a video about how to get started or what equipment is needed to begin making dioramas. So in this video I hope to answer that call. Please don't think me as some kind of expert, but in the short time that I have been building dioramas I've definitely learned a few things. I appreciate that many of you will already know many of the tools, but I guess I'm trying to think of it from a perspective of someone who's completely new to the hobby. Of course I understand that everyone has different needs and ambition as well as different budgets to play with so this video is definitely not meant to be a shopping list but more of an overview of the tools and equipment that I use on a regular basis. Also I'm based in the UK so some of the items may have different names where you are but hopefully this will at least help a little. So to kick things off what do I need to start making dioramas? The good news is not much. However, each project may require different equipment. So as you get further into the hobby, you'll quickly find that list grows and grows. But there are three vital things to consider. Space, a, a place where you will create. Some basic tools and equipment, things that will make your creations possible. And imagination. It sounds basic or obvious, but this can be applied to many things, but more about that later. A space can take many forms, but there are a few different things that might be worth thinking about when choosing a space. This can range from your humble kitchen table, to a, a dedicated space, to a full-blown workshop or anything in between. A few questions you can ask yourself. Is there adequate space to see what I'm doing? How much mess can I make? Can I open a window if using materials that have strong odours? Again, these might seem obvious to you, but just something I thought I'd mention. Next, and the main topic of this video, is some of the tools that I use on a regular basis and what they're used for. So first up is the thing that will stop you cutting into the table or desk that you're working on. It's called a self-healing cutting mat because the cuts almost disappear from the surface so you don't end up with loads of grooves from repeated cuts. Next, you will need something to actually cut your materials, so a knife will help with this. A snap-off blade. I use these all the time, particularly for cutting foam as I can extend the blade all the way out. They come in two main sizes, a small and a large. Next is a craft knife, sometimes called a scalpel, but great for fine detailed work. Again, these come in a variety of shapes and you can easily swap the standard cutting blade for custom shaped blades, which again, can all easily be found as craft sets on the internet for pretty cheap. For more heavy duty tasks, I use these retractable knives as they use a more rigid, thicker blade than the others. Again, these come in a range of shapes, but are very easily found at any hardware shop or online. And I find it really useful to keep a range of spare blades so when one dulls or gets damaged you can still continue to work. Next to measure the things that you intend to cut, some measuring devices will be essential. A simple measuring tape is always useful, but not helpful for using as a guide to cut against. So for that I use a metal ruler. This one is quite thick so it gives me a good straight edge to measure and cut against. And finally a set square can help making sure your walls are square if you're making model houses, for example. Another way of cutting things is with dedicated cutters. Again, these come in a range of shapes and sizes and styles, but here is a few that I use. Firstly, angled side cutters. These are great for removing miniatures from sprues as they give flush, fine, more precise cuts. Next are what I will call mini wire cutters, but basically they are a more robust version of the previous set. These are called long nose pliers and are great for gripping and bending and squashing small items. Next I have some full sized wire cutters which I use for cutting heavier gauge wire and can easily be found in any hardware store. I thought I would include these as well, this is not something I use too often but sometimes useful, is an adjustable wrench which works great for quickly clamping two flat materials together. Some wire strippers, which work great for removing plastic sheathing around wires. And some tin snips. These are great for cutting thin metal, but I often find myself using these a lot for most of my heavy duty cutting tasks. Next, I regularly use a pin vise to drill small holes. 
Again, these come in a range of styles, but all essentially do the same thing. When I need to drill bigger holes, I use a power drill. You don't need anything fancy, just any basic drill will usually suffice. I have a variety of drill bits to hand, ranging from tiny ones to bigger, beefier ones. Next, I will often find myself cursing at my big clumsy fingers, so for really fine detail work, I use tweezers. These can be regular bathroom tweezers or a more specialised shape, depending on the task at hand. Now, once you have measured and cut your materials, you'll need to stick it all together. So to do this, there are a number of types of glue which will make your life easier. Firstly, the mainstay of any modelling project will be PVA glue, or white glue, or craft glue as it's sometimes referred to. Essentially, it will stick most types of material together. If applied on top of porous materials, it can also act as a sealer, making it ready to accept paint. It can also be diluted with water to give different properties. Next, I have grab adhesive or a no-nails type product, which is, which is basically a less neat way of sticking virtually any two materials together permanently. Next, I have a couple of types of wood glue, but these are all essentially different forms of PVA. Some will dry quicker than others, but I wanted to show you that there are always plenty of alternatives available. Now again, similar to PVA is a product called Mod Podge. And as far as I understand, it's similar in its properties to PVA, but also comes in a gloss or a matte finish. I will often use this as a sealer in a project before painting or mixing with some foliage or ground textures to make into a paste. For plastics and metal, I will sometimes use super glue. Or another way of sticking plastics is plastic cement, which basically fuses two surfaces together rather than just sticking them. And probably my favorite type of glue is hot glue from a hot glue gun. It's fast curing time makes it great for continuing a build when creativity takes hold without having to wait for long times to dry in between. This is an 11 mil glue gun with two temperature settings, high and low temp. And the sticks come in a number of lengths. You can also get seven millimeter mini glue guns, but for anyone doing a lot of gluing, I would definitely recommend the bigger size. You can also get this glue in various colours. Here's a black one which I'm using for my current build. Now in order to apply these diluted mixtures of PVA that I mentioned earlier, I will often use an atomizer. I picked up these plastic condiment squeezy bottles online and they're great for holding washes or diluted glue for more accurate application. For yet finer applications, I'll use a pipette. Simple and cheap. And now that you have stuck your materials together, you might find that you need to remove some excess material and you can do this by sanding. You can use metal files like the ones I'm showing you now, or you can use sandpaper in various grades. And for finer details, I often use these little nail files which can be bought in a pack from your local chemist. And now the most common question I get is what foam do I use to build and I use two main types. Polystyrene, it's cheap and can be bought in big sheets of various thickness. Often you can acquire this for free if you are reusing packaging and it's easily cut. The main downside is that little balls get everywhere. <laughs> so for more precise work, such as carving details or making buildings, I use XPS foam, sometimes referred to as insulation board. It can be a little expensive, so often I'll bulk out the mass with polystyrene first and then switch to XPS foam for refinement. To build up the land mass or cast rocks, I will use plaster. I bought this one kilogram bag of fine casting powder online and it works great for holding details in casts. I also regularly use sculpt mold to build up the ground texture. And this is essentially a fine plaster mixed with mesh paper to add mass. I've made my own in the past, but for less faff, I just bought some pre-made and I genuinely love this product. It's great to work with. And now for cleanup, I have a few packs of cloths, a roll of tissue and some spray cleaner. A little brush also helps to quickly sweep your workspace clean. And to protect your hands, you may want to invest in a box of nitrile gloves. 
When using spray paint, for example, you can save yourself a lot of scrubbing later on down the line. Now in terms of paint, I use two types mainly, acrylics and oils. Acrylics are water-based paint and come in a variety of brands, quality and performance. To, to cover larger areas, I often use cheap student grade paint as there is no need to apply more expensive miniature paints to larger areas. I also have a range of artist quality paints which have a much higher and better quality pigment content than cheaper paints. You need less paint to achieve more intense colours but pay a price for doing so. Now for my oil paints, I generally avoid the cheaper student grade paint and opt for higher quality artist grade paint. This is like the Royals Royce of paint if you ask me and once you get used to using oils, they're an absolute pleasure to work with. Always keep a box of random cocktail sticks and popsicle sticks, matchsticks, bits of string, straws and anything else that might come in useful for building. I also use a wide range of modelling materials. Too many to cover in depth in this video, but these range from natural things I find in nature to homebrew inventions such as this dyed oregano to shop bought materials like flocks and static grasses. A simple hairdryer can speed up your drying times and it's always useful. I use airbrushes all the time. Again, a topic for another video, but if you're interested in learning more about airbrushes, then let me know in the comments below. Paint specifically designed to be used in airbrushes can be acrylic or specifically formulated paint for mural or automotive work. And if you're using an airbrush, it helps to take the necessary health precautions, so a mask is advisable. Now a couple of non-essential but quality of life tools that I use all the time. The first is the Proxen hot wire cutter, used to cut foam into all manner of shapes and sizes easily. And a, a rotary tool, in this case a Dremel with an adjustable speed setting. You can get all manner of attachments for these, from cutting discs to engraving and carving tools. Now you're probably feeling a bit overwhelmed at this moment, but that brings me to my final point, imagination. Now when I first started, I didn't have the majority of these tools, so often I had to come up with creative ways to solve a problem. You don't need most of the tools I mentioned, but they will definitely make your life a little bit easier. Alternatively, bargain stores are a great place to start and will often stock a number of the tools described here, so the process doesn't need to be expensive. Be imaginative, think outside the box, and let your creativity run wild. I hope you found this video useful in some way, and if you'd like to support the channel and see what I actually do make, you can subscribe and stay up to date with all the latest videos. Give the video a like and share it with anyone you think might find it useful. Thanks for watching, and happy building.